Good morning, everybody. Um, oops. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Okay. So, um, uh, so welcome back. I, I think most of you are back from last week, so that's a good sign. Um, we were, I was talking with Jennifer, is she here? Um, no, but uh, we had coffee yesterday morning, and she said that this may have been a little shocking to some, and so I, um, I, I was just thinking about how many synagogues do offer courses like this, and I I did a little quick Google search and I couldn't find a whole lot. So um, I wanted to just start by, you know, just talking a little bit more about what we talked about last week, uh, just the whole nature of what we're trying to do here and what we're not trying to do here, and then open it for a, a couple of short comments and then we'll move on. Uh, then I, I want to give a little bit of a survey of the Second Temple period in, uh, in Israel, in Judaism, uh, which was a formative period of, of what became both Judaism and Christianity. Um, as, as we mentioned very briefly last time, there was a lot of other groups at that time, such as the Essenes, and that, that, that didn't, uh, didn't continue. And, uh, uh, and the connection between these other groups and on one hand what became rabbinic Judaism and on the other hand uh, what became uh, Christianity uh, is one of the central puzzles of, of, uh, of what later became modern religions. Um, when we're talking about modern religion of whatever type we're used to having a pretty definitive sense of what our religion is. So I get emails and calls all the time. What does Judaism say about X, Y, or Z? You know, what does Judaism say about abortion? Because, you know, the Supreme Court is about, probably about to overrule Roe versus Wade. So that's a hot topic. But there's a lot of other such uh, topics. And they expect me um, to be able to say in one paragraph or two paragraphs or maybe three minutes. And, and of course, you know, our Friday night services start at seven. And so at about three minutes before seven, I usually get uh, somebody, uh, as I'm running towards the front of the sanctuary, says, Rabbi, just very quickly, what does Judaism say about capital punishment? And, and uh, so, they really want me to say it's in favor, it's against, and uh, maybe one sentence, a very quick um, reason why or why not. So Judaism favors this or is opposed to this. Um, in addition, um, everybody knows that Christianity has certain central theological beliefs. So if, you're a, if you want to be a Christian, you presumably believe in the uh, resurrection, the incarnation, uh, the Trinity. Uh, th there's uh, there's a few others, and that um, you, you believe in these things, and uh, you can explain them again in one or two sentences what that means, and your explanation will more or less match what the Pope said about it last week, and uh, if there's a too much deviation, then there could be a problem. So these are modern religions that have clear uh, definitions and boundaries. Jews, Jews practice Shabbat, uh, um, uh, uh, Christians have sacraments, and, and so forth and so on. And so we're going back 2,000 years when Judaism and Christian, where Christianity was essentially um, a, a group of Jews who had no sense that they were part of anything else. They were following a, uh, a leader, a teacher uh, named uh, Jesus, just like all sorts of other Jewish groups in the Second Temple period uh, followed uh, their, their groups. 
Uh, so the, uh, the Dead Sea Scroll group, and I'll keep referring to this because there are some stark uh, parallels. Um, although efforts to trace Christianity to the Dead Sea Scroll group have, have, have failed. Um, but uh, I remember I taught a course at uh, University of Missouri. Anybody from Missouri? Uh, and uh, that uh, the, um, uh, the, the uh, student uh, gave in a, a paper where he's trying to show that the certain Greek fragments in one of the uh, one of the uh, the caves found above Qumran, right off the Dead Sea, uh, were actually fragments of the New Testament, which would have been, uh, you know, which would have been really quite uh, um, amazing. Uh, but unfortunately, those fragments are unlikely, you know, very unlikely to have. They're very, very fragmentary, you know, just a few letters here and there, uh, but clearly in Greek, and so. Uh, it, it appears to have been from the Septuagint, not from the New Testament, uh, if, that, if that means anything to you. And if not, you can ask questions about it later. Uh, so so just, to, just to repeat from last week, uh, as probably is obvious, I'm Jewish. And, uh, uh, well, you know, everything, we want to state, state our, our biases and backgrounds pretty up front. And as a, as a Jew, uh, I was born Jewish, I was raised Jewish, um, and then I not only was born and raised Jewish, but I decided to become a rabbi, and uh, so that made me kind of a super Jew, <laughs> and uh, uh, a Jewish representative. And it, it's interesting because as a rabbi, it's quite different than being your average Jew. And so I remember being at a student pulpit and coming into the contact with somebody who's known to being quite uh, unfriendly to Jews. But he was very, very friendly to me, so apparently his respect for clergy kind of trumped, sorry, uh, sorry, let me not use that word. Um, we try to be apolitical here. Um, uh, over, 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 uh, uh, right, thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, um, his uh, any any uh, um, hostility he may have had, but uh, as, as a Jew, uh, uh, if you remember how I opened today, as a Jew, I'm not supposed to talk about Jesus. And uh, now Christians are allowed to talk about Moses because the Hebrew Bible, uh, what uh, used to be called the Old Testament, uh, that is um, that's part of the Christian sacred scriptures but the reverse is not the case. So I'm supposed to stay away from Jesus as, as a topic, um, and that, that maintains the uh, separation uh, between the religions that makes pretty much everybody comfortable. So the first thing is that we're supposed to feel a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, now, Jews are a religion, but we're also more of an ethnic group, of a, of a social class. It's uh, been very difficult to define uh, what Jews are. Judaism is easier. That, in modern times, is a religion. But there, too, uh, the, the word Judaism is really a modern invention from the last one or 200 years. Um, and, and in response to... Christians would say, my religion is Christianity, what's your religion? And Jews wouldn't know how to answer, so eventually Christians started saying, oh, your religion's Judaism, and eventually Jews started saying, our religion is Judaism. But uh, it's, it's not really a close fit, because uh, as anyone who's uh, in the temple knows, it, we're not really a, uh, a religion quite clear classically defined. Uh, so we have certain over, you know, overlapping uh, uh, ideas and, and, and behaviors. And there's, of course, many people who identify themselves very proudly as Jews, but uh, have nothing to do with our temple. And we're spending a lot of time on outreach to try to convince them uh, that they should join, join the temple and support uh, religious activity, 
and they're like, what does religious activity have to do with my Jewish identity? As long as I eat lox and bagels and cream cheese every Sunday and watch Woody Allen movies, then who are you to tell me that I'm not a good Jew? Um, now, now, one of the things that we're talking about in terms of Christianity is that we're not talking about Christianity. So in these four sections, uh, uh, we're talking about the, the, the life of a particular um, Jewish leader. And this leader is Jesus of Nazareth. And so once Jesus dies, our course ends. And, once, uh, and then the question is, did Christianity start before Jesus died? And so that, that's a question that starts to become more theological or faith-based. And so as a non-Christian, I'm not really going to weigh in on that. And so I'm trying to, uh, so I'm trying to do two things here. Uh, as a Jew, I'm trying to talk about a, a fellow Jew um, who lived and died as a Jew. And so in, in, in that level, he had nothing at all to do with what later became known as Christianity. On the other hand, there was a group that, co uh, that coalesced around Jesus, and they became known as followers of Jesus, or you could call them early Jewish Christians. And so this is a sect, S-E-C-T, uh, not S-E-X, and that was a joke. <laughs> All right. And uh, what? Don't give up your day. Oh. <laughs> Jack, Jack, I've been told that before. And I keep trying and I keep hoping for a better result. And the results are not ever better. And so uh, I, I, you know, I'm hoping when I'm reincarnated to become either a singer or a comedian, <laughs> and, uh, and people here don't think either of those things are very likely, at least not in this life, but in the next life, who knows? Um, um, but um, um, so we have this, this group that was a, a Jewish sect in the Second Temple period. And so how many Jewish sects were there in the Second Temple period? We don't know. And so the three most famous ones are the uh, Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. Now, uh, if you've heard of these three, please raise your hand. Okay. So, and, um, um, and we know um, somewhat about all three, but it's, it's very, um, very um, problematic information in, in all three cases. And so the, um, the, 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 the Pharisees, which are, are supposed to have become the rabbis or the sages of the, of the Talmud later, uh, supposed to have become that, the, they were uh, the, uh, this new group that was uh, rebelling against the Sadducees, and they came up with novel interpretations of the Torah. Uh, the problem is that most of what we know about the, the Pharisees, uh, although uh, they're mentioned quite a bit in the New Testament, and usually in a uh, oppositional form, so it's hard to know how much to, you know, how good is the New Testament as a, as a testament uh, to understand the Pharisees. You know, when you're, if Jack and I have a big fight, and then I say, I describe Jack in a document, and then 600 years they find this, how accurate is that to describe Jack? Well, we don't know. It's, it's, I'm angry at him, and so I may have said all sorts of things that are just completely off the wall just to denigrate him. So we don't know how accurate it is. On the other hand, it's probably got some level of truth in it. Um, the other source for the knowing about the Pharisees is the Talmud, is the rabbinic writings. The, the rabbis or the sages um, really emerge after the destruction of the Second Temple in the year 70, and, uh, um, and, and the rabbis write about the earlier sages, the Pharisees, 
And so uh, Jake DePetikowski, a professor of rabbinics at Hebrew Union College, wrote a famous book called Heirs of the Pharisees, basically saying that modern reform rabbis are the heirs of the Pharisees. But the truth is, we don't know much about these Pharisees other than what is described either much later or in oppositional sources. Does this sound familiar? These are many uh, similar problems to that in describing Jesus. So, uh, so that, that's the Pharisees. The Sadducees were the elite. Uh, they were the uh, priests. Uh, the, they were the ones running the temple. Uh, they were the leaders of the Jewish people. Uh, they were sm uh, a small group, as were the Pharisees. The third group was probably even smaller, the Essenes, and there's the most problematic because in the 1940s and 50s, as you're aware, um, Bedouins and then archaeologists found the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were in those caves above Qumran. Now, Michael and I are going down this summer, and we're going to try to find some more of those scrolls, and uh, uh, we'll display them here, and uh, uh, Michael will translate them for you uh, for, a for a small fee, <laughs> which you'll donate to the temple. No. <laughs> All right, well, you heard, you heard me say it. Um, and um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of material, but tracing those scrolls to the, to the Essenes is, is a bit problematic. And this has become one of the biggest scholarly controversies in Judaism in the last uh, 100 years or so. So the assumption is that these thousand, you know, thousands of scrolls and fragments found in the caves above Qumran are the library of the Essenes. But Norman Golba of the University of Chicago, for example, said no, this is actually one or more libraries from Jerusalem, not necessarily from the Essenes. And when the Romans were about to come uh, circle Jerusalem, uh, they spirited these scrolls out to the caves and dropped them in the caves. And the, the scrolls have nothing to do with the Essenes. Further, he argues, that the, what, what is seen as, uh, in Qumran as the place where the, uh, the Essenes lived, these are like Jewish monks. Uh, the, he said that's a fort. He said that's nothing to do with the Essenes. So there's, there's enough controversy to make it a little bit unclear. His views are not well accepted, but who knows? And so... Uh, if, if, we, if we do assume that the scrolls and the Essenes are, that scrolls belong to the Essenes, you have a group, maybe they numbered 6,000. Uh, they, they didn't marry, they prayed, they believed in purity, they had mikvahs, they, they, you had to donate all of your goods to the group before you could join. There was a long period of, of being a uh, novice, to being in training. Uh, it was very hard to be accepted, and once you accepted, you were completely at the mercy of the group. If they took you in, they take all your property, and then if they threw you out later, you'd have nothing, and you'd starve to death in the desert. So um, uh, the life there was very, very austere. There were apparently, a, and they didn't marry. Uh, uh, Pliny the Elder describes them, he says, they, they live in the desert near the Dead Sea with only palm trees for company. That's what he says. Um, um, there are many doctrines that you find in Dead Sea Scrolls that are similar to that found in early Christianity. And so, as I said earlier, there, there's just the, the sense that there must be a connection. But it may be an indirect connection and not a direct connection. So uh, th there are those who say that John the Baptist was an Essene. And then he left the group, maybe, and then had his own followers, of whom maybe Jesus was one of his followers. That would make Jesus not quite an Essene, but a follower of a former Essene who broke off to set up his own group. Um, but you could see the uh, early, early Christian asceticism coming uh, very much from the, from the, uh, from the uh, Essenes. You could see many of the religious doctrines. 
Uh, we're not going to get into it today, but um, Daniel Boyarin of University of California uh, came out with a book just a few years ago that, again, Michael referred me to, and I'm, I'm reading it. I, I stayed up late uh, reading it because he's very radical. He says that basically all the ideas of, of Christianity in the first three, four hundred years, all the ideas do not, none of them come from paganism or Greek, Greek culture. They all come from Judaism, including the Trinity. Uh, so, of course, this goes completely against what every uh, Jewish kid learns in religious school, that Judaism believes in one God, one God only. Christian, Christianity believes in the Trinity. That's one of the fundamental differences between the two religions. Uh, Boy Aaron argues that that was not true 2,000 years ago, that there were plenty of Jewish mystics running around uh, saying that there were three aspects of God. Also, that there was an idea in, in Judaism at the time uh, that God could have a son. So all of this is profoundly disturbing to people that like these uh, clear definitions of what is Judaism, what is Christianity, and what are the, the differences, and these are uh, clear uh, distinctions. All right, I'll stop here, and if you want to make a few short comments or questions, uh, this is a good chance. Uh, Riva's got a microphone, and uh, uh, we, we can start. Just please keep your comments relatively short, to, let's say uh, 60 seconds or so. Yes. And, and please say your name at the beginning. I believe it's plenty of the elder, but I'm I'm citing it from memory, so I could be wrong. The elder. <laughs> One of the plenies was uh, died in, when Vesuvius went off, I think in 79 AD. I think that's probably the younger. Because uh, Daniel wrote, thank you. I'm sorry, I had difficulty speaking, but uh, could you please spell the author's name and the text? Um, uh, which one, Daniel Boyarin? Yes. yes. Uh, Daniel Boyarin, B O Y A R I N, and the book is called The Jewish Gospels, which is uh, in itself a very provocative title because, of course, uh, Gospels are associated with Christianity. He's saying the Jewish Gospels. So he's deliberately trying to, uh, if not provoke us, at least sell books. When was the uh, date it was written? Uh, about 10 years ago. 10 years ago. Oh, I, I, I spit too much when I talk. You really <laughs> Good question. Thank you, Bonnie. All right, that's a that's a great question. So there, there's a couple of things in there. Uh, so the the uh, the first part. I'll take the second part first, and that is why can't Jews uh, uh, include some of the wisdom of Jesus in our 
uh, you know, sermons or teachings or something. And uh, Claude, Claude Montefiore um, of the famous Montefiore family in England in the 1890s was the co-founder of what became liberal Judaism in England. Uh, Jews loved to form groups. And so in America, we have three main groups, Reform, Conservative, Orthodox. In England, they, they thought we better, we have to out, we have to out uh, do the Yankees. So they had two reform groups. One was called Liberals and one was called Reform. <laughs> so um, this is the liberal group. So um, Claude Montefiore said um, uh, he was a professor at Cambridge University and uh, he said what Bonnie said, pretty much exactly, that Jesus was another uh, wise Jewish person from 2,000 years ago, which would put him in the category with, uh, with uh, Hillel and Shammai and so forth. So why couldn't we in our, let's say in the liberal prayer book, where they put a quote from Rabbi Hillel, you could, on page 12, you could have a quote from Rabbi Jesus on page 14. Um, right? That's basically what you're kind of suggesting. And so the, the others in his group said, well, yes, you're of course right, but in the 2,000 years since that, Jesus has become branded, you know, branded as a, uh, a teacher of Christianity. And so we simply can't, undo that branding. So uh, while there's nothing in most of what he's quoted as saying, even in the New Testament, that would go against Judaism, we can't use him because he's already so associated with, with another religion. Kind of like, I guess, if, you, if, if there was a, uh, a new amusement park and uh, Mickey Mouse's uh, copyright has expired, you can't use Mickey Mouse because he's so associated with his, you know, with certain things or, or you know, you know, examples. Uh, one, what, let me just answer her rest and then Bob, you can go next. Uh, the other part is Bonnie's use of the term Rabbi Jesus. And this is used by a number of people. Uh, Bruce Chilton, who's a professor at Bard College in New York, a suburb of New York, he has a book uh, called Rabbi Jesus. Um, now, I, I, um, I don't think historically you could actually do that because we, I mentioned briefly those three groups, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the Essenes, and presumably the Pharisees led to the sages, which is the rabbis, and that's when rabbis came along. And as you recall, the Sadducees that I mentioned, they were the priests in Hebrew Kohanim, and they were the ritual and religious leaders of the Jews up until the destruction of the temple when the rabbis took over because there was no temple. The problem with calling Jesus a rabbi is the word rabbi in a technical sense refers to the, 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 the scholars and um, uh, legalists of of the Pharisaic tradition. So these were a, a, a couple of hundred people, men mostly, who spent a lot of time, although not all their time because most of them were trades, they were sandal makers and, and locksmiths and that sort of thing. Uh, locksmiths is a little bit of a joke, but, um, but they were trades people and uh, they, um, but they spent most of their time, or as much as they can, they could uh, studying, uh, studying the oral law, which was their innovation. And that's a very controversial comment, but uh, I, I'm slipping it in there. And so uh, Jesus was not trained uh, as a Talmudic uh, st uh, uh, thinker or Talmudic debater, you know, not at all. So. To, you, you could call Jesus a rabbi in a broader sense of rabbi means teacher, but in a narrower technical sense of, of Jesus as a Talmudic rabbi would not, would not be accurate. So Bonnie is correct. You could call rabbi Jesus in, the, in a very broad sense as a teacher Jesus, Jewish teacher Jesus, uh, but not in a technical sense. Okay, Bob? Hold it closer. 
That's much better. That makes all the difference. Um, so if we follow the Paula Fredrickson book, then she, she says Jesus was a religious teacher and a social teacher. Uh, and so according to, the, to her um, uh, I- interpretation, uh, Jesus didn't form a threat to anyone. And indeed, as we said, there weren't just these three sects of Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes. There were hundreds of smaller groups subgroups of the various three groups or other groups and these followers of Jesus were were one or, or more of them actually uh, now now these four sessions we're doing were really only covering Jesus during his lifetime and the split between Judaism and Christianity that Bob made reference to occurred later although when exactly that occurred is is uh, not you know, I can't tell you in one sentence, but uh, it occurred sometime in the second century or, or even later. Uh, there were Jewish Christians running around for three or four hundred years who were still part of the uh, Jewish people and part of, of Judaism broadly conceived, although they very quickly became a, a minority within, uh, within early Christianity, but they existed and they continued to go to synagogue and to observe Shabbat and to do all these things. Eventually, some of them were just re- reabsorbed into Judaism, and some of them uh, were absorbed into Christianity. Uh, there's an interesting case of a, a text that we have. It's basically a translation uh, slash interpretation of, of the Torah that was apparently written in Syria, or, or, or Turkey, um, and uh, uh, this text, we have the text, we don't know who did it, but the theory is that it was, uh, that it was produced by a group of, of uh, Jewish Christians uh, who were mostly still Jewish um, up in northern Syria somewhere, and that at some point after the, the completion of this work, they were absorbed into the uh, general Christian group and ceased to exist as a separate group. Uh, any, any final comments at this point? And if not, I'm going to go on to the, uh, uh, to the issue of the historical Jesus and the different theories. Um, yes, one more comment, a comment or, or two more. Okay, hold it. Uh, one and then two. Ah, and who wrote about the Essenes? It was also Pliny the Younger? Um, it would have to be, because okay. Pliny the Elder is one that died during the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. He got two quotes. Oh, my condolences. <laughs> <laughs> so he was concerned about the Pliny the Younger, was concerned about the rapid spread of Christianity. 
Aha, uh-huh. and so neither Pliny the Elder nor Pliny the Younger were Christians, were Jews or Christians. They were Roman pagans writing about this phenomenon they observed. Therefore, at least in theory, they're more ob- uh, objective outside observers. However, they don't say much. There's a few comments there, uh, uh, but they don't go into great detail. We have other historians like Josephus that someone mentioned last week, uh, who is a Jewish historian working for the Romans, and uh, uh, he goes into more detail, but there's problems with his descriptions as well. Thank you very much. One last comment, we have Max. And then hold the microphone close. Uh, closer. Uh, James Carroll, they wrote a book called The Sword of Constantine. Uh, uh, I think that's a very, I, I read it fairly recently. I found it very enlightening on a lot of this stuff. Uh, that's uh, A Sword of Constantine is a history of anti-Semit- Christian anti Semitism. Um, he, he, uh, it's a very good book. It's a very long book. Uh, Max, how many pages? Well, it's pretty good size. Okay. It's like. <laughs> It's like hundreds and hundreds. Well, not hundreds, but quite a few. <laughs> um, he, he is a little, he's a commercial writer, so he, he's, uh, he sometimes tends to be on the dramatic side, but that's a good thing sometimes. Um, I want to now move to um, the um, historical Jesus theory. So, uh, um, as I suggested, I'm doing two things in, this, in these four sessions. One is I'm giving uh, a Jewish perspective on Jesus, which is unusual to even talk about it. Uh, the, uh, the other thing I'm doing is to just speak uh, and give a little bit of, 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 of academic information about the life of Jesus. So the book that you might read, if you choose, it's not required, we're not testing you, uh, is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, a Jewish Life and the Emergence of Christianity by Paula Fredrickson of Boston University. And Fredrickson is a scholar. So um, she, she works out of a university, and her job is to write uh, um, material that is substantiated by, by, um, by, by scholarship. She's not there to write theology. She's not there to advocate for anything. She's supposed to write what can be demonstrated to be true as far as she's able to. However, that is the theory. In practice, uh, different uh, scholars say very, very different things. So uh, in the last 200 years, there's been an interest in finding the historical Jesus. So before that, there wasn't really even an effort to uh, say we want to strip away theology and polemics and we want to try to find what can we know about the actual person, uh, Jesus, who lived, in, uh, who lived in Israel in the first century. And Bart Ehrman, who's another professor, he's at the University of North Carolina, he writes a lot of books. Uh, in one of his YouTube videos, he jokes that when he starts his course, uh, at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, one of the better universities, uh, he, he asks a series of questions. And he says, anyone that gets over a certain score, he'll take them out to dinner. And he said, out of 200, 300 students, he, last year he took one student to dinner. And he said, these are not hard questions. For example, he said, what is Jesus' last name? And of course, the answer came back from some students. Right, <laughs> and um, now Christ means Messiah, and so Jesus Christ. So Jews would not refer to Jesus as Jesus Christ because that implies that we would accept uh, Jesus as the Messiah, which uh, of course we would not. Uh, so, but it was a funny thing. Uh, he also asked, "What language did Jesus speak in?" And of course, a handful of students would write. English, and uh, 
well, they can't imagine anybody speaking any language other than English, uh, but a lot of them would say Hebrew, which is also not right, and Ehrman uh, postulates that maybe it's because in these documentaries, when they talk about Jesus, they usually show in the background these ancient Hebrew scrolls. So they associate uh, Jesus with Hebrew. Uh, but of course, the answer is Aramaic. Uh, and it's possible that Jesus certainly knew a little bit of Greek, uh, uh, and, and he knew some Hebrew from the sacred scriptures that but, but he didn't necessarily study them uh, from the text themselves, but he would have been able to quote uh, a bit from there. But anyway, so the historical Jesus theories refers to what these different scholars have tried to make sense of who Jesus was. And so, um, so Paula Fredrickson, the, the scholar that we're looking at in this, uh, in this uh, uh, mini-series, uh, she falls into the category of Jesus the apocalyptic uh, a speaker. So apocalypse is when the world comes to an end in some sort, and she's arguing that Jesus saw the end of history as coming very shortly. And there's a number of other scholars in this, uh, in this school of thinking Bart Ehrman, who I've mentioned, uh, E.P. Sanders, whose work I really like, uh, John P. Meyer, who is a Catholic priest uh, teaching at Notre Dame, and, and, and many others. Um, but there's other um, um, scholarly uh, portrayals of Jesus other than Jesus the apocalyptic speaker. Uh, so, for example, there are those who see Jesus as a political revolutionary. Now this is, uh, this is the other most likely uh, scenario because, of course, the Romans, according to the New Testament, the Romans executed Jesus by crucifying him. And this was punishment done for political revolutionaries. And that's one of the central uh, problems that Paula deals with in her book is that if she portrays Jesus as somebody who's preaching that the end of the world may come soon and that God alone can bring redemption, not people, so therefore there's no, we just have to pray and repent and do good works and that sort of thing, but organizing politically to fight against the Romans is not the answer, then why would the Romans execute him? You know, and that... And she, she, I don't know if I want to give you the end of the book because then you won't read to the end. Uh, but, uh, but, but that's the central problem that she's trying to answer. Uh, but she, what she doesn't do is say that he was actually a political revolutionary. Um, but others do. Uh, Reza Aslan, you may have heard, he became very famous. He, he's a, not a, a borderline scholar, let us say. Um, but uh, he, he, uh, uh, he wrote a, a very popular book which sold hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of copies about Jesus in which he argued that Jesus was a political revolutionary. He called the book Zealot. And so you are all familiar with the Zealots who fought against the Romans. In the, uh, they, they actually fought, or, or, or Jews fought, three revolts against Rome. The first one was the Great Revolt, 66 to 73, a CE. So this is about uh, 40 years after Jesus' crucifixion. Um, and uh, then the second one was the Diaspora Rebellion, 115 to 117 CE. And the third one was the Bar Kokhba Revolt of 132-135. And so there were three, three great battles against the Romans. Uh, and the Jews lost all three, uh, catastrophically. Um, but uh, there were a lot of people uh, pushing for these uh, confrontations to say, "Let's we got to fight the Romans. We cannot tolerate this anymore." And the Zealots were the leaders of the first of those three, certainly. And uh, some people similar to Zealots were operating in the second and the third one as well. Uh, so. Jesus, as a zealot, 
uh, would put him in a very different light than Jesus as the apocalyptic speaker. Um, another another uh, image of Jesus that emerges from uh, scholarly work is uh, Jesus the wisdom sage. And so uh, John Dominic Croissant, uh, if you've heard of him, he's very famous, writes a lot of books about Jesus. Uh, he's probably the most famous representative of this school. And so uh, wisdom sage, uh, wisdom, uh, when we talk about wisdom literature, we're talking about a specific type of biblical writings uh, that emphasizes uh, wisdom. And uh, 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 these scholars see Jesus not so much as emphasizing apocalypse, but rather to emphasizing the teaching of wisdom. Now, for us, this may be a rather subtle difference, uh, but but for those familiar with the literature, it, it's, quite, it's quite different. Uh, there's others that see Jesus as thoroughly Hellenized, that he was really a Hellenistic Jewish teacher. And so Hellenistic Jewish, uh, Jewish wisdom or Hellenistic Jewish uh, knowledge was um, a very important strand of, of Judaism. And so you have... Philo, and you have many Jewish thinkers who are trying to reconcile uh, Hellenistic thinking with Jewish thinking. You also have the Maccabean Revolt, which occurred in the second century BCE, or roughly 200 years before Jesus' cru crucifixion. And the Maccabees were essentially fighting against radicalized Hellenism. So the Jew the, there were Jews in Israel who were uh, very Jewish, shall we say, in a country way. And so the only thing they knew was a sort of a, a primitive form of, of Judaism. And then all these newfangled philosophic concepts come in and uh, more assimilated uh, cultural behaviors, and they resented that. And so the Maccabees represent the group that was against uh, Hellenization. So there are those that see Jesus as uh, quite Hellenized. Uh, and uh, there are others who see him primarily as advocating for, uh, for social change, such as Hyman uh, Maccabi. And uh, they, they said that he's basically uh, you know, talking about the poor of society and how you have to uplift them. And so he's more of a social reformer rather than a political revolutionary or a theological uh, radical or, or, any, uh, or a Greek uh, philosopher. So you could see that within uh, scholarship, there's, there's quite a few views. Uh, and and uh, uh, Paula comes down as, as, as emphasizing that Jesus was teaching the apocalypse. And next time, uh, uh, in our next session, we'll talk about what that meant to be a Jewish advocate for the apocalypse at this time. There was a whole school of thinking that, uh, that, that advocated for this. And you could see that as the Romans' behavior became more and more cruel and extreme and tax rates went up and poverty increased, uh, it seemed like the end of days might be at hand. Now, this is a completely Jewish concept. There were various Jewish writers in the Bible and elsewhere who are saying this. So if Jesus was the way that Paul uh, uh, portrays him, he would fit very nicely into the uh, religious debates of, of the late Second Temple period. I'll stop here and I'll take a few comments or questions. And I see, um, you know, Bonnie Longmire and over there. Okay, um, say your name and hold the microphone close. My name is Mike. Hi, Mike. Hi. Good to be here. Thank you. I'm a Christian. I'm just a Christ follower. And as I read the accounts in the Bible of how Jesus was crucified, I read that Pilate at Rome did not crucify him but be an insurrectionist. In fact, Pilate deliberated with, with and argued with the, the religious leaders who demanded the crucifixion, saying he could not find any fault with him. And what happened was he actually just gave in because he didn't want the clamor to reach Rome that he was unable to manage his own territory. 
he had a reputation as the Pope. And so to say this, to, to keep this situation within the radar in Rome, he gave in to these religious leaders and, and his followers of them that were clamoring for his crucifixion. It's all written in Luke, right. which, which is known as the most thorough account of the events in, that, in Jesus' life. Um, thank you, Mike. So, um, yes, so this is something I was avoiding, uh, so thank you. Uh, um, but the, uh, as I guess we all probably know, there are accounts in the New Testament and elsewhere that essentially uh, blame uh, uh, the Pharisees or, or certain Jewish leaders for pressuring Pontius Pilate to carry out the crucifixion. And uh, so, um, the, the, and, and there's a famous uh, um, paragraph in the book of Matthew where the Jews accept uh, the um, crucifixion as being uh, our responsibility. And we say the blood of, of, the, of the blood is on our hands and we accept that. Uh, that's correct? If you believe that the Jews are responsible for No, well, I'm saying in the book of Matthew it says that. So, so, um, so, so this is uh, this is much of the source of what became uh, early Christian hostility to Jews, and and uh, led to a long history of anti-Semitism. Now, um, as you read this book by Paula um, uh, Fredrickson, you'll you'll have to see what how does she respond to this uh, to these accounts. Uh, I, I just lost over them, ignored them, because, you know, we're, um, I, I wanted to present maybe the more positive aspects. Um, so um, if, if this were to be taken as historically accurate, then uh, it creates a lot of problems for Jewish-Christian relations, because then uh, a group of Jews are responsible for executing what became the Christian savior. So, um, so this is very, very sensitive. So um, now how accurate is this historically? That's really difficult to say. And as you saw just the last minute, there was uh, uh, scholars who uh, uh, talk about very different portrayals of what actually happened. So I'm kind of skirting the issue. I don't want to address it directly, partly because obviously I don't know what happened. We don't, uh, we don't have any way to ascertain how accurate a given account is. Um, but but in, this, in this version, basically, uh, a, a group of Jews are upset at Jesus for religious um, uh, violations, for, uh, for, for challenging the religious uh, beliefs of the Jewish leaders and, and want him executed for that. Uh, uh, Fredrickson in this book argues that the um, that that basically Jesus was an apocalyptic teacher that there was not a conflict with Jewish leaders um, that he came to Jerusalem uh, regularly uh, she bases herself primarily on the uh, Gospel of John rather than the other three Gospels and that Jesus had a three-year mission that was centered in Jerusalem, and in contrast to Mark and Matthew and Luke, uh, which locates Jesus' mission primarily in the Galilee, she sees him uh, operating mostly in Jerusalem. And, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, that, God's, uh, that Jesus' apocalyptic message was that God, rather than the Jews or rather than any other people, that God alone would establish God's kingdom, which is again a Jewish concept, and that the Romans feared the crowds rather than anything Jesus was saying. And so the Romans decided to crucify Jesus and others as a warning to the crowds who were um, you know, threatening uh, rebellion. So this would basically discount the accounts that we're talking about as historically accurate. Uh, but I want to be very careful to say that that uh, you know that I don't know if she's right, but that that but that would be if we accept the the accounts that we're talking about, then we have a much more serious problem in Jewish-Christian relations today. So, 
Uh, I'll, Mike, do you want to respond? Uh, I just missed uh, hold, hold on, microphone. think that this setting is designed to be an interfaith discussion about Jesus. And, and from the pulpit there, you had the opportunity to make statements that she had the opportunity in her book to make suppositions that without being counter, don't paint the whole picture of what, what's going on. Um, I think that um, she's trying to be careful, but there's anybody writing about Jesus has to at some point make suppositions because there's just not a clear historical record. So you could go this way, you could go that way. I would, you know, I'm not, you know, I have a PhD in history, in Jewish history, but not in this exact area, of course. And I'm not trying to pin you down or anybody here, but I'm just saying there are different beliefs that seem to be accepted. Right, and uh, uh, and I accept that 100%, Mike. I think that um, that one of the reasons that we chose to follow this this one book is just to give us some some guideline. Um, and uh, Fredrickson is herself Jewish, and she presents a very uh, a friendly version of of what happened. So it it seemed like a good model. But I acknowledge that there are certainly other models out there. Um, but, but if we follow that version that the Jews are responsible for uh, killing Jesus, uh, uh, then, then we have a, a problem. Okay. <laughs> and we'll come back to this topic, I'm sure, in the, in the next two sessions. were probably about 6,000, a small group that, took, uh, that were connected with the, uh, the doings of the temple, the sacrifices, things of that sort. Um, men were supposed to be circumcised. Uh, there were food um, restrictions. And um, this incident of the crucifixion must have been a small group compared to the whole of all the Jews. And uh, I do believe it was very political that the, um, the Romans were once and for all going to not let the Jews uh, upset uh, of the uh, status quo. And um, that Pilate uh, was the one who uh, killed Christ. Uh, and that um, uh, originally women first began to understand what Jesus was uh, uh, talking about. One God other than many like the Romans had. So there was a political problem at that time. Uh, to, to blame the Jews entirely, um, I think, is uh, being uh, a bit unfair, and that the, the circumstances that the Jews lived in from the time that the Romans took over, uh, and uh, after um, uh, uh, Alexander the Great had died, and his sons uh, divided the, the political uh, atmosphere. Um, there, there was a, a very unkind atmosphere for uh, these people who insisted there was one God. Jesus was uh, going around preaching one God. Uh, from what this book says, the particular period was all after the death of 
um, uh, of, of uh, Jesus. Uh, there was a, 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 a feeling that the, the world was going to be coming to an end soon, and Jesus would be return, returning soon. The atmosphere was very, very bad. We're here to try to find the man who preached the one God concept. Now, now if the women brought the, 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 this idea of J Jesus came, the men weren't going to like the idea of circumcision. <laughs> so that was, <laughs> that, uh, there was then, then the uh, idea Jesus didn't care about circumcision. He didn't care about pork. Uh, <laughs> so the, uh, these two uh, uh, things alone would uh, make uh, or change in Christian thought as it went forward in the 200 years uh, of our common era. Uh, uh, thank you, Ray. Who lived and preached one God in a very bad I think Jack was next. Thank you, Ray. Um, and Ray is only one of four of our uh, um, most serious congregants and who happen to be over the age of 100. And we, we, we also have Miriam here, who is also, and, uh, and there's Cy Perlis, who's at home, and, uh, and another as well. Jack. If any of you uh, purchased the Luke and David New Testament, what she's referring to, Rabbi's referring to, is covered in Matthew 27, and basically Pilate said, hey, so when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather than a riot at the beginning, he took some water and washed his hands and said, I'm innocent of this man's blood. So Pilate took no responsibility for the crucifixion. And going back to earlier uh, in Matthew 5, said, Jesus said, I don't think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth passes away, not one letter of the law or one stroke of the letter will Um, the, the, yeah, this, this is the Jewish, the Jewish annotated New Testament. It was one of the books that Rabbi shared at uh, Shul uh, a couple of weeks ago. It basically was the New Testament with annotation uh, written from a Jewish perspective. And it's not, it's not, you know, I've read through it. It's not any different than many other Bibles that I own. Um, uh, one or two more comments, and uh, we're, uh, with your permission, we'll go slightly over 11 a.m. So hopefully, you're buying lunch. <laughs> uh, uh, Jack said, "I'm buying lunch." Um, Um, and um, th this is a, a very large issue, um, and so we're gonna uh, we're, we're gonna talk about this uh, at you know in the next two sessions as well. Um, and but we're not going to be able to come to any conclusion because of course we're dependent on the limited sources that we have. And as we already pointed out, those sources were written you know twenty to forty to fifty years afterwards in a different language than they were originally yeah so it, it's uh, it's not going to be possible to come to any conclusive uh, decision this uh, plate is St. Stephen's it's just the Jewish historian his age he was born 37 AD and died in 100 AD so there's been 
Yes, your name? Uh, hi, I'm Leslie. Hi, Leslie. Yeah. Um, you, Rabbi, you mentioned that earlier about Jesus being the Messiah, the Messiah, and that he Is accurate. I have to see the exact reference, but I believe so. I like. I, I mean, the, the the comparison of Jesus uh, and Luther is quite amusing. Uh, I, 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 it does have a certain. Uh, uh, it, it does make sense in a certain level. Uh, you said a lot of interesting things. I don't have time to respond to uh, because we're over time. But we'll take at least one more question or comment. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, sir. Hi, my name is Catherine, and I'm a Christian. And for people who claim to be Christian and spouse teachers, um, we would say they are not Christian because hatred is a tool of evil, and anti-Semitism is an abomination, regardless of what Matthew says. 
for those who take that one passage out of Matthew and use that to justify anti-Semitism? We would call that an abomination. It is absolutely horrible. And anyone who is espousing hatred is causing evil to expand in the world. And that is not the basis of our Christian faith. Because Jesus told us, love one another. It was his one commandment to us. And so. Uh, that's very beautiful. Um, now, of course, we still want to try to make historical sense of of that scene in Matthew, and uh, we we will come back to that. Um, it, it it it's a difficult it's a difficult passage to explain, uh, but that's beautiful thought. Um, uh, last question or comment, and then we'll call it a day and. Uh, um, uh, Jack, uh, where are we having lunch? Uh, it'll be the most expensive restaurant in Sun City, and just tell the restaurant to bill it to my account. Um, oh, okay, Jack, and then and then Nick. Uh, and that's recited every every Friday night in our services, correct? Hi, my name is Nick, and um, I just want to quote the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10, B is a brother, for Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus came at a time when there were troubles in the, in the Jewish world, and he could see these troubles and the people suffering at the hands of corrupt uh, church of uh, seven of leaders and uh, the Romans himself. And this uh, saying of I came to give you life and that you can have it on the thing. To me it's the most important thing that he ever said because it's not salvation that we're talking about, it's salvation from oppression and not a spiritual after death salvation. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, that's you said. God, John, John chapter ten, verse ten. Verse ten, brother. There's two parts to that verse. Did you want to say something? There are two parts to the verse. Okay. Uh, I think that's it for today. We we sorry we ran over a little bit. Um, I I have a little time if anyone wants to talk to me up front. And thank you for our our. We we have a, a video crew here from Hollywood. And so ha have a good day and see you next week. Thank you.